All right, good, <coughs> good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are going to start our next session. I'm going to introduce, I'll just request Leonard and Rachel to please come on the, on the stage. And uh, I'll introduce both of them, and then we'll, we'll begin. Um, so first of all, it's a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, two friends. Uh, first is uh, Leonard uh, Wonchikon, who is a colleague here at Princeton, professor of politics and international affairs. Um, Leonard's work focuses on political and economic development, particularly in Africa. And he um, has many things I could talk about, but one of, one of my favorites is that Leonard is kind of crazy um, in the kind of things he takes on. And um, one of the things he has taken on is uh, he's uh, set up this uh, brilliant, um, um, uh, or started this brilliant initiative in Africa called the African School of Economics. And it's really an amazing story, the how he single-handedly, I don't know if he mortgaged his house or what, but you know he, he took a number of crazy risks um, <laughs> to, uh, to get it off the ground. But it's really a wonderful success. We, uh, we have Kareem here sitting in behind, who's a faculty member at African School of Economics. So I really want to use this opportunity to kind of showcase that, uh, that really terrific institution. And we very much look forward to the product of this uh, initiative in Benin, uh, but more broadly in Africa. Um, Leonard also happens to be my next door neighbor, so I have inside information on, on him that, <laughs> the, that the rest of you may not. Um, and uh, you know, um, none of you probably knows, but he's also a rising star in the field of hip hop dance. So I think that's something you can, uh, you can talk to him about as well. Um, I'll, uh, uh, now I'll, um, I'm very happy to introduce um, our uh, keynote uh, speaker, uh, Rachel Glanister, and she will uh, be sort of involved in a conversation with Leonard. Uh, that's the format we have. And then towards the end, we'll open up for question and answers. But really, when uh, I was introducing Ragu, I, I, I mentioned how hard it is to kind of straddle two fields, academia and policy. Um, with Rachel, what's, what's really in incredibly impressive is that not only has she straddled those two, but she's equally well straddled the third field as well, which is institution building. Um, and um, again, as Leonard can attest to as well, it's, 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 it's very hard to build something and to um, to take it to a next level. Um, Rachel, uh, currently she is uh, chief economist for the UK Development for International, uh, DFID basically, the Department for International uh, Development. Um, and uh, she, before that, and she's currently on leave, she was uh, the executive director at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL as it is known. It's become very famous because recently um, the Nobel Prize was awarded to the wonderful work that has been done at JPAL and, and beyond. And, and really, uh, the, the Nobel citation also very uh, aggressively recognizes Rachel's contributions in not just uh, developing JPAL, but her own academic contributions as well in this uh, development literature, which has really overtaken uh, the world in, in, in many good ways. Um, in addition to all of that work, um, building JPAL and, and, and her academic uh, work, she has also been actively involved on the policy side. Um, before coming to JPAL, she was at the IMF working on issues such as uh, debt relief and the reform of the international monetary system, and God knows we need that. Um, so she, she, she really comes in with a wonderful experience, broad-ranging experience, both from the macro as well as from the very micro, and we are very pleased to, to, to have her. Thank you for coming, and look forward to the conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So uh, thanks, Atif, for such a wonderful and generous introduction, and uh, thanks, Rachel, for, for coming. Um, so I'll get started right away. Um, I, uh, my, my first question will be a very general question about the link between micro and macro development finance. You know, I mean, when you want to think about resource mobilization at lo local level, you need to uh, look at uh, finance at household level, personal level. And um, so what, how, what is the evidence in terms of uh, the way, you know, micro level development finance uh, linking to macro development finance? Yeah, th thanks, Leonard, and, and great to be here in this conversation. Um, I, so I think 
A real challenge in in fragile states and low income states in general is the lack of integration uh, between the macro and the micro level as well as we would think. I mean, having been, I worked on monetary policy in the UK, and uh, you know the the levers that you would that w you would pull to be able to stimulate the economy in the UK are just not 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 in the same way um, working in many of the countries that, that we're worrying about in many fragile states. So, you know, if you, you can tweak the interest rate um, in the UK and, you know, and, and get a reasonably predictable response um, in, at the lower levels of finance, and that's just not, that's not the, the set of tools that, that you have when you're working in a developing country. Um, you know, you can try and tweak stuff and kind of, you're, not, you're pulling a lever and nothing's happening on the ground. Um, I mean, I have to say that, that that's, that's true in the positive way. There are, of course, things that you can do at the macro level that will totally screw up the micro level. Um, uh, you know, you can, you can cause hyperinflation, you can have parallel exchange rates, you can... Um, uh, uh, you know, you can have a major uh, debt crisis, which will cause a lot of pain um, in uh, for 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 the micro level for individual households. The challenge is that you don't have this as as uh, as good and and clear and sort of um, persistent a link uh, when you are trying to stimulate the economy, and that's partly because. You've got, I mean, we've talked about sort of the role of banks um, and their lending to firms. In a lot of the countries um, that we're talking about, virtually all the bank lending goes just into uh, funding the government deficit, and very little of it is going out to firms and going out to, 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 to households. And so sort of you've got these kind of local, really small level financing of investment, um, which is just coming from sort of circular loans within communities, the Roskers or um, the Sousas or, you know, other traditional things, which aren't linked to the formal financial sector. So the vast majority of people in a fragile state won't be linked to the formal financial sector at all, which is part of why you have this disconnect between the macro and micro. So, um, I mean, fixing that is a long term problem. But it does mean, I think, that that when you're thinking about finance in the developing world and particularly in the really low income developing world, you have to think both about fixing macro finance and about micro, because at the moment they're not very linked. <laughs> So, so thank you very much. So I, I you know from there, I, 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 we have a stronger sense of how financial inclusion is a critical component of development finance. Now, um, you have done, you have written with co-authors, Banerjee, Duflo, and Keenan on um, the microfinance miracle. So when you want to communicate this to investors, for instance, are they warning label? Are they... Uh, you know, are there limitations, you know, to yep. to microfinance uh, when you are thinking about, um, you know, especially in fragile states? Yeah, so I should say, I should be be clear that, um, you know, there's a question mark on the end of our title, microfinance miracle question mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and basically the answer is no, it's okay. not a miracle. Um, so um, it's... Um, you know, so this was this. It was interesting when we started um, JPAL. We sat around at the beginning and and said, "What are some of the biggest questions that we think uh, there's a mismatch between what the expectations and the the level of kind of certainty out there in the policy world and what actually is the evidence?" And right at the top of the list was microcredit um, as something that people kind of assume they knew what. What, that it was very effective and yet um, there was actually very little good evidence. So it was kind of on our target list right from the beginning. It was very difficult to evaluate. Um, and we did a randomized control trial um, of uh, after many years of searching for the right organization who was willing to put themselves up to being rigorously evaluated. We did a randomized control trial that found, you know, our conclusion was that it was a useful financial instrument for helping um, uh, helping households to smooth their income a bit, but it was not uh, it was not uh, transformative in any sense. Um, you were slightly more likely to start a business. Uh, there was no increase in women's um, 
uh, empowerment as a result of, of having access to microcredit. And, and, and a number of other studies were done at a similar time that found very similar results, that it was useful, but not it wasn't really making a difference. And I think, in a sense, you could, um, you could almost say that you could get that lesson um, by just looking at the distribution of firms, something that people have talked about, you know, in low, in in low in income countries. Um, uh, you know, I always like when I look at a question to look at the micro evidence and also look at the descriptive evidence, look at the, you know, the randomized trials or the impact evaluations, but also draw in evidence from lots of other places. And just looking at the descriptive evidence of the distribution of firms in low income countries tells you a lot. What does it look like? Huge spike of firms at, you know, the size of zero to two people in the firm and very, very few um, middle or large firms. So, uh, so Neil was talking about the, it's not so much the missing middle, it's kind of the missing everything apart from the micro firms. Now, micro credit is designed to help you start a micro, micro firm. You know, that's, that sort of tells you enough, almost, <laughs> that that's not really the finance thing that is, that is the problem. Like, you know, we found that it made you more likely to start a firm, but, but these people are starting firms. That's not the problem, right? There's poor people in poor countries are starting firms all the time. Uh, in our control group, there are lots of people who are starting firms. So, so that's not really solving the main problem. Yes, people need access to financial instruments that are, can help them smooth uh, month to month. And a lot of people we found were using microcredit as a savings. Mm -hmm. Um, it's an incredibly expensive way to save, like a really inefficient way to save, but that was the only way that they had to save, so they're using it to savings. So, so we need a distribution of financial instruments, but it's not going to be transformative because that's not really where the problem is. Thank you very much. So now let's focus on uh, fragile states. So uh, one of the tensions that we discuss here is uh, the massive needs of capital investments for infrastructure and reconstruction, and the fact that the state is too weak to absorb those funds. Now, do you, can you point to specific ideas and models in how you can think about state building to solve this problem? Like, for instance, should we give, should we focus on international organizations, the regional development banks, should we substitute to some degree to the states? Should we also go all the way down to think about community-driven development um, as a way to build the state from bottom up, you know, as opposed to top down? Okay, you just sort of listed like all the problems <laughs> and all the issues in one question. So um, let me let me try and, and take them one by one. Yeah. Um, so big financial needs um, and absorptive capacity. Yeah. First of all, let me say, um, you know, we've been talking a lot in this in this conference about how to attract external finance. Uh, there's a big financial need. Uh, how do we attract external finance? Uh, I think it's really important to understand there's a lot of finance in these countries already. I mean, not a lot, but there is finance. It's always going to be the majority of finance. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, and it's uh, you know just from there is sa people are saving in these communities even when they're very poor. It, there's a question of you know allocating the finance effectively is a huge problem. So, but then if you're there's no question p these countries do need external finance as well. Um, so you asked about absorb absorptive capacity. I think there's a couple of different ways that we can think about absorptive capacity. Again, co coming back to your first question, macro and micro, mm -hmm. right? So at the macro level, there's a question about if you have big inflows, um, how do you handle kind of the, the, the macro um, questions around that if the flows are, are intermittent? Um, you know, is there exchange rate risk or, or is it or, or rather just exchange rate damage that you can do to potential exporting firms if you have a lot of aid money coming in? And that's something that we have to think, think about. How do we balance that? Um, so there's sort of macro absorption. And then there's just um, sort of the practical issues of are there bottleneck constraints? in absorptive capacity if you're trying to do kind of a whole lot of infrastructure 
um, you may end up in a, in a poor country bidding up the price of a few very scarce commodities, which are normally talented people. That's kind of one of the, one of the scarcest commodities. Uh, any, any uh, you know, the people who've tried to make things happen in developing countries are nodding their heads at this, right? Like just the number of, of, of highly um, skilled people to run big projects is just it is one of the constraints that you you have. Um, so I think thinking about when you bring in when you try and do a post conflict you know reconstruction program, thinking about those those scarce commodities, I'd say the really scarce thing that you have in fragile states is um, the, the, the most scarce commodity is not just talented people, but talented people in government and attention of those people. So the main thing that I think we screw up when we come into develop, to, to fragile states in, say, a post-conflict environment is we try and push so much. You know, we want to reform land tenure, we want to reform the exchange rate, we want to reform the civil service. And there's kind of usually about five people who are really good in the government who can really think um, about kind of innovative new things to do and you can't, and they just can't take on all of this. And there's also limited absorption capacity of reform in the sense of political will. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you've got to be careful about where you allocate that political will. So, you know, there's a limited amount of tough choices that a government can make in a fragile situation and you don't want to overload those. You've got to pick the few uh, that you can take. So now, your next question is about state capacity. How can we improve state capacity? I think one of the things that you want to do is not try and do it all at once, right? Um, exactly for the reasons that we've just talked about. Um, and you need to, you know, so think about the priorities and and the then the challenge is when there is weak state capacity, the incentive of donors and others trying to come in and help is to go round the government mm -hmm. yep. and find alternative routes for delivering education or delivering. But if you um, if you always go round, you're never going to build. Mm -hmm. So it's this tension that donors face about we've got to do something fast um, and yet we, do, we want to do it in a way that builds capacity. Also, really importantly in fragile states when you're worrying about conflict is building legitimacy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you, you know, if you always go round, you're undermining the legitimacy of the government. So that was this kind of long old uh, yeah. question. Now you you also raised <laughs> community driven development, so I can go on to that if you want yeah. um, as as one way. So this is this is a, a program that that is kind of almost the default thing that a lot of donors go to in a post conflict environment, um, and uh, and certainly the World Bank has done a huge amount of this, and it and it comes in somewhat different guys is, but the basic idea is to provide funds that are somewhat flexible to communities themselves in a reconstruction period for them to figure out what they think is the most important. So instead of having a decision at the top that we're going to build schools or we're going to build roads, you give the money to local communities to, um, to, to build what they think is the relevant thing that they need. Um, and I think so. So I did. I I was working in in Sierra Leone um, in, after the the end of the civil war. So I started work in two thousand and four. Um, have stayed working in Sierra Leone ever since. Been a fascinating to watch the transition. You know, they were really moving out of fragility. But we did a rigorous evaluation of a community driven development program there. Uh, money from the World Bank went to the government, who then. Um, allocated it to through working closely with the new district authorities and providing funds to lo really, you know, quite small local communities. Um, uh, you know, I think a couple of hundred households was sort of the the, the level uh, mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Now, there are all sorts of things that people hope that community driven development can do. It, can, you know, they want it to build capacity of the local communities. They want it to be inclusive. They want to use it to teach people the importance of bringing in women. What we found was 
it wasn't very good at any of those things, <laughs> building institutions. It was really good at just getting money out of out to people who needed it, and they built infrastructure. Like these communities, the communities that we got this money built infrastructure. We, um, you know, they had better schools, they had better toilets, they had just if we looked, if we mapped the infrastructure of these communities, there was just more of it. There was also more um, economic transactions going on. There were more people selling things in these communities. There was just uh, more economic dynamism in these communities um, that received this funding. We went back 10 years later. There is still, they are still better off now. More sustainable. Uh, yeah, so they, they have these, commu the communities that got this money were, uh, still have higher infrastructure uh, than, than the ones that didn't get it. So my takeaway from the, and people have looked at, that done a sim similar studies in Liberia and Afghanistan and, and DRC, and my read of that literature is, this is a good way to get money out to communities in a really fragile environment where the state isn't very effective, um, I, you can get money to them and they can use it quite wi mm -hmm. wisely, even without a huge amount of oversight of exactly, I mean, there was oversight of how they spent it, but, um, but, but it was a good way to get money out while you're kind of building the state. No, I'm, I'm a strong believer in uh, community-driven development for two reasons. One is one you mentioned, information, uh, and also empowerment. You know, like uh, when you have to make the decision, um, you feel like it's your decision. It's not just something which is imposed on you, and it's more sustainable. Now, uh, my next question is about, okay, is, okay, in, is there a role for, like, development finance? in service delivery? Because service delivery is always, is always perceived by the public finance. You raise taxes, and or people raising money on their own to build schools. But then, you know, a very ambitious entrepreneurial community might in fact want to go to the capital markets and get uh, loans so that they can build a, a much bigger school, so that they can add additional in, in a clinic, for instance, they are going to build an operation room, you know, whatever. So, and, and I know, for instance, that um, in Ethiopia, for instance, you have uh, diaspora, diaspora investment fund I involved in channeling private resources into local service. Do you, do you see a, a, a room for, you know, development, traditional development finance in helping service delivery enhance state capacity? Right, so I certainly see a role for the private sector um, in in helping deliver on service delivery. I mean, if we think about, um, you know, where we are in, in richer countries, the private sector plays an important role. That may not, they, you know, in some countries, the private sector runs schools, um, but even when they're not running schools, they're providing a lot of the, you know, inputs, they're selling, to, selling things to schools, they're... Um, uh, so there's there's a, there's an important role for the private sector, and we shouldn't try and I exclude it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's different from so they pr the private sector will to some extent raise its own finance, uh -huh. um, whether that's internationally or domestically, um, and certainly in a lot of a lot of poor countries where the the state has really failed. Mm -hmm. Um, you just see the private sector coming in and substituting for that, um, and you see, you know, you see a lot of schools across the developing world that are, uh, you know, that are private schools. A lot of people sending their kids to private schools. I mean, health is a huge private market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but the m most of the funding for health in poor countries comes from out-of-pocket expenses. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, pharmacists tend to be private. Uh, so it's kind of, it. D I think people have this sense of um, if something is either private or public and actually most markets are really um, integrated and both private and public. And it's not even that, I mean, that they're public-private partnerships in that the school was built by, that, that's not what I mean. I mean, think of the health chain. The health chain has, you know, different goods are being provided by the public or private private sector. Uh, you know, the, the private sector tends to be the, the companies that, you know, 
produce the drugs and then the government might buy them uh, or they might su and they might be sold through a private sector pharmacist so you know there's all sorts of uh, there's a really complicated you know some of the discussion about public versus private is so unnuanced whereas actually on the ground it's so integrated and complicated and nuanced and so there's a lot of space for so all of those private companies can then raise raise funding. I think, um, and you know, we should be thinking about that. Um, uh, and I, I've done some work on on how to, for example, stimulate how the public sector can help stimulate private sector investment in um, in diseases. You know, get the private sector to work on coming up with solutions to diseases um, of the developing world, because at the moment they're basically mainly focused on just solving, you know, coming up with drugs and vaccines for for rich world problems. I think the the then there's this question of can you raise funding from the private sector to fund what's kind of more traditionally public sector things like schools, I, um, and I. So I think what you, what's interesting there is to think about what's the stream of revenue that's going to pay it back. <laughs> um, and what you don't want to do is set up a situation where in order to pay back the revenues, you end up providing the service in a way that's non-optimal. So, you know, in order to pay back the revenue, you, you need to, you know, be charging for healthcare. Or, you know, and you may be happy to charge for certain types of healthcare, but we absolutely know that charging for preventative healthcare is a really bad idea. So I think what what we need to do is think about what is what is the what's what's the optimal way for the consumer to 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 have to get the social services, mm -hmm. and that may be you know free at the point of use, and distinguish that from who delivers it. Right. So so for, for preventative care, I feel very I think the evidence is incredibly strong that you want people not to have to pay at the point of use for preventative care. Like it's just really inefficient. But that doesn't mean it can't be private sector because you can have a private sector then and then subsidize. So so I was talking on the pod, the student podcast earlier. I was saying like every question, you break it down into the different questions, like which bit has to work, you know, What's the most optimal? You know, what's the consumer, whose uh, experience? What's the, uh, you know, who's funding that? How do you make sure that that when you fund it, it doesn't distort what the consumer experience is? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, the, the, the point here about this is that I mean, there is a room, and I think it's already happening, especially diaspora funding, remittances, and stuff. And, and I, I, there might be a way um, to get for instance, uh, better coordination between yep. uh, among the people who send money home as opposed to just sending money for funeral. You get together so that a school is built. And then you set up institution so that, um, you know, there is some accountability in terms of a service uh, being delivered properly. So, but okay, there is something else which I think it's important that we don't talk about enough. It, it cannot just be all about money. It cannot yep. just be about finance. It has to be about you know people just wanting to do something good for themselves you know for the community where they come from so um i mean i just want to wait to comment on for instance the role of those intangible factors like uh, you know integrity generosity generosity you know and willing to get back whatever <laughs> to make all this investment we want to to to, to make in building states effective yeah, so I mean, people have been talking about it through throughout the conference. There's there's a desire um, for for so, you know so, social benefit from mm -hmm. the investment that they make, and that we've mainly been talking about. Uh, you know, the previous panel was talking a lot about savers in rich countries wanting to know that 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 saving is going into social good, but it's also really important. Um, for the people, you know, either in remittances, they want to, you know, they're more willing to send back money if they think the remittances is going to be useful. It's important in aid, you know, if we're going to sustain providing overseas development assistance, it's really important that, that people feel that that is being spent usefully. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I think the question is, is then how do we try and 
um, monitor and verify that on, and convince people that funding is going into um, high quality projects that are actually making a difference. And I think that's really important. A, it's just, I started with the, the issue of allocative efficiency, mm -hmm. right? You, we want to make sure that finance goes to the most effective thing. Mm -hmm. We also think that you'll get more finance from various different groups if they are convinced that it's going to the most effective thing. And that requires understanding more about what's effective, mm -hmm. uh, but also then having some kind of monitoring or um, uh, process or to, to, to make people feel confident that what mm -hmm. they're spending um, on is going into something effective. The real trick in that, though, is to do that in a way that is not incredibly expensive in uh -huh. terms of, you know, in terms of monitoring costs. Yeah. Um, and and controls and things because you know like we said with community driv driven development actually these communities can often spend the money quite effectively if you just let them get on with it and if you try and micromanage them they they you may end up not spending it as well so so that's a really important trade-off i mean on the on the particular thing of remittances yeah. and diaspora bonds yeah, yeah. Uh, people have done some interesting work looking at this point of can you tie that money? Mm -hmm. You know, if you provide instruments that sort of force that that money goes into something which the person wants wants it to go, you know, it's an investment rather than they worry that people will just, you know, their family will just spend it on consumption. Will that lead to to additional um, resources coming? And I think I think as I say, it's re it's important that you. A, there's enough flexibility that people can spend it on what's useful, but also that the monitoring that it's going into something important is... is. So in DFID, we've been thinking about um, outcome funds, which are uh, the idea that, um, you know, it's a way not to micromanage, but to ensure that there's impact, mm -hmm. um, is to, to say, uh, you know, you, you, you're willing that, you have to prove that you've say, uh, you know, this investment has actually led to more girls being educated or, or increase in consumption for the really poor, and we'll pay you on the basis of outcomes at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and then you get, and the idea would be if you get this really working well, is to have kind of a market of ideas, and the people who have the intervention that is most going to be most effective at getting more girls educated or getting um, uh, getting income up for, for poor women, uh, then the, you, you sort of have a market and your competition and, um, and, and the best ideas win because they can do it at lowest cost. Okay. I mean, we're still a long way from that, but mm -hmm. I hope that that's a, that's a direction that we can go in. And then people would be able to feel that they could put that money in knowing that they would actually get the the benefit that they hope the the positive outcome that they're hoping for. I, I think you, you you raise a very very important point, but which I think would be uh, one of the big um, uh, kind of items in development research agenda, which is institutional efficiency as opposed to just policy yep. efficiency. You know, like yep. what is the best way to get people to make the best decision for themselves. You know, I mean, like, it's not just about, for instance, you mentioned CDD, which is very important, but there are several ways you, you, you can run CDD, you know, that one in which, you know, the donors move first and people follow, one of which information or there is voting, there is deliberation, there are a lot of ways you can actually do these things. And I think what you are pointing to is the, the, the need to look at this thing more rigorously so that we can have policy prescriptions which include the way the policy should best be implemented. I think this is a very important point. Now, to follow up on that, could you maybe tell me, tell us, you know, the audience, for instance, uh, where you see, uh, you know, the, 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 the area where we should maybe focus some attention in terms of research agenda? You know, um, right. You know, what, what are the area of focus? What should be the area of focus of this work that we all be doing? Right. So. Um a big question, but I think one area that is, I think, really important. Um, we, you know, we had a panel with a number of uh, DFIs on it earlier, and I think um, 
you know, and some interesting debate about are they crowding out private finance or are they crowding it in? I think this is really important question um, and one that we really don't know the answer to. Um, I mean, there's sort of a lot of a lot of hypotheses about if if you know uh, a DFI, which is um, government, basically ultimately government donor supported, uh, goes into more risky areas and and proves that that. Um, that the risk is maybe not as high as people thought, and then that will crowd on in other people. I mean, my initial reaction to that as an economist is just, you may have lack of information, but why would you always systematically, as the private sector, overestimate risk, right? So maybe the DFIs go in and prove that it's more risky than the private sector thought. So, I mean, that's a very unnuanced view of what it is. Maybe it's that, uh, as Neil was saying, you can't, you don't know how to price the risk, so you don't do it at all. But, but I think there's a lot to unpick in that, um, in that whole thesis. And it's just a really hard question to get at. It's not like the DFIs haven't been trying to figure this out, but it's a really hard question of, 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 um, how do you, you know, if you go in as sort of subsidized lending, do you actually end up pulling in other other private sector or do you crowd it out? And I think that's a really um, that's a really important um, question. Another question I think that's really um, that's that's also be, been raised in the DFI agenda but is but I think is really critical is monopolies. So if you look at what what is uh, if you look at some of these poorest countries you will find that the prices are really high. Um, and there are a few firms of, uh, really dominating the market. And if you look at sort of the margins on lots of, you know, standard products, they're really high in, in these poor countries. And what you want is kind of healthy competition. Um, and that's just not what you're getting. But what is it that we, is that, is there something that donors or, or you know, uh, external financial institutions or others can come in to do uh, to break down those monopoly rents uh, by, you know, funding additional companies that are going to then compete? Or are so many of these countries so small that that's just not going to work? Um, or is it transport costs that is keeping those monopoly prices high? This is this is such a critical question because the poor in the the poorest countries are paying so much higher prices for so many goods, um, uh, and uh, you know so it's a, it's a really first order question, and we just don't know how to get those prices down. Uh, and in terms of consumption, you know. You can either try and increase people's income, or you can, or you can reduce the prices. And and I, we've thought a lot about increasing the, uh, increasing the the incomes. We've actually worked very little on kind of reducing these prices, um, given that these prices that the poor pay are just so much higher than what what we who can afford much higher prices, end up paying. So I think that's a, that's an important question. Um, I think these, I think. Um, uh, you know, as the donor world, I think a lot of what we need to do to attract, uh, I mean, what the, as donors we worry a lot about is kind of regulation um, and the, the sort of infrastructure of the state in regulating private companies because that's where we have kind of more leverage. Um, but I still think when understanding, we, we too often go in and compare regulation in in poor countries to the regulation we have and say, well, you know, you're missing X, Y, and Z because we have that. And that's not the way to think about it. It's like, what should the regulation be for a poor country? And I think, and we don't want to burden them with, you know, as, as, as they say, when we go into post-conflict environments, we tend to kind of write regulation, you know, we hire a consultant to write regulations that then look just like the UK regulations. That's clearly not the answer. To, you know, they don't have the capacity to do that. They don't have the need. The, so the market instruments are not as sophisticated. Um, so, but I don't think we quite have the answer of what should regulation, what is the right level, what's the right kind of regulation that is appropriate for, uh, you know, a very fragile state. You need some regulation, but you don't want to overburden it. And, it, and it's not, it shouldn't look like the West. 
Um, and I think there's lots of important questions um, there too. No, this is a very important point. And we have to worry about state capture, you know, firms yep. controlling uh, development fund by, you know, controlling the regulatory agencies and so on. Yep. So thank you very much. That was, uh, that was, uh, that's, uh, that was really fascinating. So now we are, we have uh, another 25 minutes perhaps for, for questions. Yep. Yes. Sure. Thank you very much. That was a great conversation. Um, so one of the scarce commodities, Rachel, in fragile states is security and secure property rights. So I'm wondering, uh, this is a preoccupation of us at ESOC, at the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project. I'm wondering if you can share with us some of your thinking about the relationship between the development and security communities um, in ensuring security. Insecurity also has persistent effects. So for example, one thing that strikes me when I look at the enterprise surveys, firms in countries like Pakistan continue to pay enormous sums for their own security, you know, many years after there's been violent conflict in some of the major cities. Uh, so again, you know, what would you as a development person say how we can bring in the security community to provide those uh, secure property rights and that sense of security that's fundamental to investment? And then just a, a quick observation. One of the things that strikes me about many fragile states is that we impose actually overvalued exchange rates on the countries that makes it very difficult for local entrepreneurs sometimes to compete with imports. And that also suppresses some of that business activity. Yep. Um, boy, if I knew how to provide security for fragile <laughs> states, I would, uh, it would be very good. Yeah, so um, you certainly have to worry about uh, making it worse. We think a lot in DFID about uh, providing humanitarian assistance. Uh, you know, you're pouring a lot of money into humanitarian assistance, and we know that 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 groups, you know, armed groups are see that as an opportunity, see that as a rent that they can try and extract, um, and uh, you know, so the big you know, always trying to think about do no harm. And it's it not so much that I would worry about is some of it going to be stole, stolen, you know, sort of siphoned off um, in in payments. But it um, it's more the thing that would be much worse is if you actually generate conflict because of the payments going in from donors. So, um, you know, people have... Uh, of instead of shipping like truckloads of cash they, or food, they've tran they've shifted to transferring it in mobile money. Now that still doesn't stop the armed groups coming up afterwards. They know who's getting the money in the uh, on the mobile uh, and mobile payments, and then asking for it. But it, you know, it maybe helps a little bit because uh, it's more dispersed. Um, I think uh, I. I mean, one thing that I think is hard but is important is just is thinking just really politically about what are the elite bargains that are needed to get to. So, um, and this is where as an economist I get kind of slightly awkward, but, you know, if we've spent enough time working in these countries that you realize it's, it's necessary, we sometimes go in with kind of, you can't just look in a fragile state at what's the technocratic solution, because if the technocratic solution means that the, the people who currently hold power get screwed, not going to happen. <laughs> so you've got to think about uh, what are solutions which are going to uh, both benefit the general population, but also um, lead to, you know, the elite doing doing better. And that, that makes us all uncomfortable because um, we don't want our development finance to be going into improving the positions of the elite, but but they've got a they've got a benefit from security. Like the people behind the conflict have got a I mean it's sort of basic um, game theory is they they've got to they've got to think that they will get make more money out of peace than they're making out of war, 
Um, and so I think kind of thinking about any given um, problem, any given security situation that you're in, um, and thinking about who are the elites, who are who are the ones who can cause trouble, and making sure that they will benefit more from peace. Um, I mean, that's a very general statement, but I just think I just think we are too. You know, sometimes we're too technocratic in it in in trying to solve this. We want um, a not not being upfront enough about the deals that kind of have to be made. And and we've got to we've we've got to be willing as a you know population that's a, supporting aid or or the involvement of our countries in these states. It we've got to be we've got to understand that we're not we can't get to perfection rapidly. <laughs> uh, we've got to put up with some some nasty characters being involved in government because otherwise they'll be outside and it's better to have them in. Um, so it's 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 a certain amount of tolerance of lack of perfection, which I think is 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 my answer to 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 that. I mean, you know, it's far from a comprehensive answer. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Hi. My my question is, what is the legitimacy of the infant industry argument in current economic thinking. And let me make two further points. One is that I was in Princeton class of 71, and uh, when I studied economics uh, then, um, even Paul Samuelson acknowledged in one of his edition, one of his basic economic books, one of the, whichever edition I read, is that he felt that infant industry argument had some legitimacy um, back then. That was around 1970. And uh, second point is that I was, growing in Taiwan in the 1950s when it was still a very poor country. And uh, I remember that for certain industries, like for example, cement, because the, at that time the Taiwanese government foresees that for their infrastructure development, they will need a lot of cement. However, to get local entrepreneurs to build cement plants, because cement is a capital intensive industry, the government had to guarantee them an ol oligopolistic situation, and not monopoly, but oligopolistic situation, where they say, you know, say for the next 10 years, there'll be no more than three cement companies in Taiwan. And uh, uh, so that the entrepreneur feels comfortable, they will earn a acceptable rate of return. And uh, so, I'm, so my question is that this infant industry argument, which very often leads to monopolies, or oligopolies, uh, is this still, in current economic thinking, is this still a very respectable argument? Um, so I think there's a lot of debate um, currently in the economic community about um, how much you you know about this this argument and whether you need a certain amount of protection or a certain amount of subsidy to get some industries going. I guess I would say a couple of things. One is I think we have to worry a bit about when we look at the the portfolio of countries that have you know, benefit, and a lot of people will say, well, look at the countries that have succeeded. Um, they had, you know, protection for certain industries. Um, and I guess my my response would be, look at all the ones who didn't, didn't succeed. They also had <laughs> protection for those industries. Um, I, I worked on Gabon for a while at the IMF. Um, if you ever want an example of a country where they have poured lots of money into companies that, you know, uh, to diversify out of oil, you know, they, they put a lot of money into, uh, into trying to get infant industries going and a, uh, a lot of subsidies and other things. Uh, they are strewn with white elephants. I mean, it's just, you know, they spent their oil money and they ended up at the end of a massive oil boom with an absolutely, um, you know, horrible situation, like worse human capital indicators than, despite being middle income, worse human capital indicators than the average of the of sub-Saharan Africa. So, so just just remember kind of survivor bias issues that that yes, the successes did this, but so did all the failures. So, you know, I think that's important to remember. I mean, it is the case that we think that learning by doing. Um, is important. Like there's, there is evidence that learning by doing works. So you know, you get better at something if you do it. 
Uh, it's also the case that there's a, there are agglomeration gains. So that's there are externalities that no individual company uh, will um, will will take on. So that is an an economic argument for providing some kind of government support to getting a cluster of things going. But I just think the number of times that governments have tried to do it and and wasted a huge amount of money um, is, you know, we need to bear in mind too. I mean, in some ways, when we think about the problems of a country that is because of money coming in for oil or other commodities, which means that there, it's very hard to do export-oriented growth, um, uh, because they're stuck in a kind of primary commodity trap. And the standard advice is, well, you know, you should diversify. Well, you can't diversify because your exchange rate is such that it, it's pretty important, impossible to. Uh, I mean, you know, one argument is just say, spend that money on developing uh, the human capital of the country and they'll they'll figure it out. I mean, <laughs> you know, get the things get the things to the point where they'll be able to figure out um, what to do. Because you, as an outsider, can't aren't very good at figuring out what what they will need in ten years' time when the oil goes runs out. But I have to say, I'm probably more on the extreme of the anti infant industry than the 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 uh, the the. Um, than the people, you know, if you take the spectrum, I'm probably on the the, the most anti. Um, but I, but nevertheless, I see that there is learning by doing, and there is a agglomeration which you have to take into account. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, okay. May I, um, Rachel, the UK government is taking a very proactive stance towards Africa these days. Yep. Um, if you think of the trade-off from the DFID perspective of pursuing, I suppose, more independent policies in order to tailor outcomes that will address some of the challenges you've described, or running through increasingly some of the established development institutions. Um, which one would you advocate? Sorry, can you... Um, in the sense you mean, that... You mean as, as in, the, the UK doing it on its own or working yeah, with Yeah, through others? its own institutions, giving DFID more money, giving CDC more money, or working more explicitly with the African Development Bank or the World Bank um, in order to achieve, as I say, the outcomes that you've talked about? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I don't, this is something, we're always going to do both. I, mean, um, I think um, the, so so first of all, the, the focus on Africa, I think, is really interesting and important. Um, you know, DFID in particular, is, has, amongst all the, the development um, agencies has had a strong focus on on giving money to the poorest countries. You know, it's much more much more of our funding goes to the poorest countries than than most development agencies, including, you know, the World Bank and other people like that. So, so I think that's one one benefit of doing some of it ourselves is actually we're much more targeted uh, than most of the other groups that we work with. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of things that we can't. Uh, so, sorry, just to fo finish on the Africa point, um, you know, I think there was a really interesting and important decision that was made within the UK government to say working on Africa is a long term project. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about can can overseas investment build markets that are then beneficial to us in the future? And the, and the conclusion was yes, and there's a lot of promise in Africa over the long term, but it is over the long term. So we should be doing investments that are really, we should be thinking about our planning of engagement in Africa as really a long-term investment. And I'm very, very proud of kind of the, the working that went into that and some of the decisions to focus on Africa in that way. Can we do it? We, the UK, do that all on our own? Absolutely not. We've got to work with um, with other institutions. Um, and, and we spend our time kind of thinking about where are the niches where we have comparative advantage uh, versus other organizations. We have, we only have grant capital, for example. We don't have a lending instrument. Um, so there's certain things that Grant, and and most other organizations don't have grant capital. They only have lending instruments. So, so what makes sense is to think about what we where you want grant capital 
and where where a combination of grant capital and and loan capital of the sort of blended finance that we were talking about earlier works. Um, and there's you know there's been a lot of discussion should we should we create a bank a UK bank I mean you know the the con of that is there's lots of banks out there already and we can have more of an impact by by combining our our instruments with others so i don't think it's so much uk versus not it's it's recognizing that we have different financial instruments and you need different financial instruments to do different things and but coordinating together um, you, you know, you can think about a problem and break it down and say, well, the bank is best place to do these things. We're best place to do these things. Um, and a lot of our grant capital, though, does actually end up a, you know, saying being blended finance with the IFC or, or buying down things in, uh, you know, providing a guarantee to Jordan uh, to allow Jordan to lend more to, from the World Bank. So it's those kind of ideas uh, we recently, you know, there's now the idea of the of IFID, which is a, a new approach where you would make you would slightly subsidize lending to um, to educate for education lending. So, you know, where can you complement the grant with the lending to, to get more than the more than them on their own? Hello. Um, so my question is uh, very broad. Um, so I guess apologies in advance for that, but it's about getting your thoughts on the interplay um, of the public and private sectors in development. So we talk about the public sector um, stimulating the private sector to work on things like tackling disease in the developing world, about giving subsidies to the private sector to tackle issues, or having public-private partnerships, maybe encouraging impact investing, et cetera. But what do you see as the balance between incentivizing and helping the private sector to contribute to development or generally to helping the world versus, in a sense, forcing it to or reining it in, the latter of which would refer to things like higher taxation, tackling global tax avoidance, maybe enforcing minimum wages, government intervention in those monopolies you were referring to that make the poorest people pay the most for the consumption of goods, or any other kind of public sector-led initiative that might not be in the direct or best interest of the private sector, but could result in a more, in a sense, forceful redistribution of wealth. Okay. Um, so. So I'm 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 just I sort of take take any prob any individual problem and say what is you know a, apply a kind of standard economic 101 <laughs> lens to it of saying you know where are the externality you know is the private sector going to do the effective thing uh, or will it not because there are externalities because um, there are coordination problems. And I just go kind of through what are the market failures and then what are the government failures? Because we all too often forget that there are government failures, governments that don't have sufficient information. They're not uh, to make decisions well. They don't have the right incentives always. So so I think instead of having an ideological view about, you know, is the private sector good or the public sector good? It's kind of about taking a problem one by one and saying, what are the what are the market failures and what are the best ways to to solve those market failures? I mean, in general, I think in the developing world, um, you know, if we're talking about this issue of attracting um, finance or improving finance, again, it's not just attracting finance from the rich world to the poor world. It's also about making most of the investment that's done in fragile states will be done using domestic resources, right? So it's helping make sure those domestic resources are used effectively is just as important or maybe even more important than attracting funds. So so make it have it, the the biggest role that the government can play is in making sure that the environment is appropriate for, you know, for improving that um, that investment climate. And that's about having appropriate regulation or, you know, access to land. Um, and a lot of the times it's about getting getting the government out of, you know, in fragile states, it's often about not over-regulating um, in the sense that, you know, having to pay for, you know, pay a bribe to get this certificate or pay a bribe to get that this other certificate. So it's trying to make regulation effective because at the moment you have to pay for to get all sorts of certificates to do anything but actually there's no actually you know environmental standards are ignored so you've got kind of the worst possible worlds where the government interferes a lot to prevent 
the private sector from doing things, but it's not actually being effective in delivering the the, the positive outcome that you want. So, so it's not really about more private, more government or less. It's sort of doing it so that it has the outcome that you want. Um, and 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 I, I I really think you have to kind of take things case by case. One one more, yes. Hi. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so my question is about financial inclusion and its relation to regulation. So a lot of the times in a post-conflict environment, you have international aid agencies kind of coming in and providing financial assistance that's conditional on certain regulatory reforms like the ones you were talking about. My experience uh, tends to be that in a lot of those systems, you require overhauls of banking systems or strict money laundering laws. Um, and things like that that then result in the transaction costs, if you will, of opening a bank account, something as simple as that, going up. And unfortunately, those transaction costs are asymmetrically uh, geared towards or asymmetrically higher for the people who are middle and lower income who would benefit the most from financial inclusion. So I guess my first question would be, you know, is do you agree that there can be this kind of trade-off um, uh, when when you have aid policy or any type of development policy that is meant to kind of bolster regula regulation or efficiency, but then ends up deterring financial inclusion? And then the second part of that would be, is the solution then to kind of encourage banks to work within those systems or to uh, promote alternative forms of financial inclusion like digital credit or digital savings or ROSCAs, which are, in my view, kind of a second best outcome. Yeah, so I, so, I mean, this comes back to the earlier thought that um, I completely agree that we often come in and in, uh, encourage or impose regulations that are much too sophisticated and burdensome uh, and not appropriate for a very fragile state to to actually implement. Um, I understand why that's why that happens. Uh, people are worried about terrorist financing. Um, they're worried about a, a particularly, you know, if, if any government money is, you know, Western government money is going in, they're worried about um, misuse of those funds. But I, uh, but I agree that, you know, and then all the bad headlines that might result, but I agree that actually we end up sometimes making things worse because we just prevent financial inclusion. So I think this is what I was saying earlier, that I think the area for research that I would really encourage people to work on is what's kind of the regulation that is appropriate for that kind of environment, which is not going to be what it is in the West. Um, so you get what you need in terms of safety for for consumers because that's really important because people have lost so much money from you know banking collapses and other uh, uh, other you know people walking off with their money so you do need some regulation but but it has to be you have to think of it as a way that's that's lower burden I think the um, I think your point at the end about kind of c can digital make an improvement here I think there's there's a real potential in trying to help set up kind of I, digital IDs that then uh, will move with people as they move as they de get displaced, whether through climate change or um, natural disasters or conflict, um, and that that will make it easier. So you can just use a thumbprint to to get access and uh, not have to fill in lots of forms. Um, and I think India's set a really interesting example uh, in Adhar of trying to do digital identities in a very streamlined, simple way that other people can then benefit from. Um, so I, that's, I'm, I'm, I think there's a lot that we have to explore um, with digital identities that, that could be useful. And as I say, we're already kind of using cell phones to get disaster money out um, and in post-conflict environments in a sort of easier way. So so I hope that'll that'll reduce the burden of um, of you know proving your identity. Of, obviously there's risks that you know people can use that those digital identities to you know discriminate or do other things that that, that you know bad stuff. Um, but I on the on on the whole I'm kind of average I'm on average, I think it's uh, you know we'll probably see more benefit than cost on that. One last 
Okay, sure. Um, thanks so much for this conversation, which was great. Um, I guess I had a question or a couple questions about what you do with the leftover goals that don't quite get realized uh, in your first efforts. So you had a couple examples of this. One was, we're going to send the money down to the local level. We hope this is going to include women's empowerment and a whole range of other nice things, but it didn't quite work out that way. So when that happens, what happens to that additional goal of women's empowerment? Does that just disappear or is there some other thing that happens in addition to that? Um, and then kind of a similar um, uh, framework a little bit was, you know, well, we would rather get the bad guys out altogether, but we realize they're going to have to make more money at being part of the government in a peaceful setting than they would in a conflict setting. So is then the long-term goal, hopefully eventually we'll figure out how to get the bad guys out, or is that just a permanent now fixture of the new setting, and how do you manage that? You got, I mean, again, if I knew the answer to that last one. Um, uh, I so, so let me start with the women's empowerment one first, because I think that's, um, I think I know something about that. Um, so I, I guess sometimes we overload too many expectations on one program. You know, we want it to solve everything. And many people thought that we were, t when we came out with our paper on CDD and it didn't improve women's empowerment, uh, people thought we were, you know, saying it was a disaster. And we were like, no, you, this is a post-conflict environment, like communities, you actually built stuff in 2004, Sierra Leone, and that's amazing. Um, and yes, it didn't do all these other things, but, but don't, you know, you should be really happy that you got those those positive results. So, so I'm part of it. I think is lowering expectations um, to to more realistic levels about what you can actually achieve, and then kind of celebrating those because I think they are really important successes. So, don't um, in, you know? I see a lot of aid programs that are trying to solve all the problems in one aid program, and I just think that can overload the system sometimes. Um, I think there are things that you can do for women's empowerment. I think I've been really encouraged with, um, there's a whole set of results now about um, about working um, safe space programs with adolescent girls. Um, people have looked at that in Uganda. I've done a, a study in Bangladesh. There's some new work in um, in uh, in Sierra Leone where what was really encouraging is where these programs were working and then the Ebola crisis hit and you saw young women who are extremely vulnerable then being put into an even more vulnerable situation. Schools were closed. There was a big spike in teenage pregnancy. Didn't happen where these programs had been in place. Um, uh, so I think, I think there's, there's, there's practical things that we can do to improve women's impairment. I think it's, I think, you know, we just have to keep testing the evidence of what is the most effective thing to do there and scaling up the things that work um, and not but not trying to overburden every program to, oh, and you also have to make sure that it does women's empowerment. Like sometimes I'm a big fan of women's empowerment, but sometimes that's just a step, you know, that let's just do another program that we know that will work on that um, rather than claim, over claim that everything is going to help it. Um, on the, I mean, the political economy one is just really bad, really, really hard. Um, if you, if you, it's true that you worry about entrenching elites when you do political bargains at the end of wars. To, but, but the, but when the alternative is more conflict, I'll take that deal, because the people who suffer in conflict are the most marginalized people. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's young, uh, you know, young, poor um, uh, women who are going to end up uh, being hurt the most from conflict. And so sometimes there is an ugly trade-off, which means that you, uh, you know, in a sense to protect them, um, you you allow the elite to continue to have an unfair share of, of income. What you're aiming for is to get to a situation where the economy is growing sufficiently fast that, you know, A, everyone improves, um, but also maybe, you know, the poorest, more vulnerable people have more, more room to grow, but at least, the, you, you know, the elites aren't 
may, may have a declining share, but an increased absolute amount. I mean, that's the perfect thing, right? There's the, <laughs> the bad guys have a declining share, but, a, but, but, but their absolute um, income is not falling. Um, and, and I just think that we have to be careful when we go in with these technocratic solutions to also have this, you know, be really aware of, of the political context and the, and the power games that are happening. And sometimes, while it's interesting, whenever I talk to people on the ground doing development, they are absolutely aware of that. They kind of can't put it in their program documents. And, uh, and, and so we end up sometimes people who understand these issues end up advocating for something that doesn't, you know, the program gets implemented in a way that ignores the political issues, even though the people designing the program understood it. And that that's a, somehow we have to be able to make it more okay to talk about the political bargains um, because otherwise we'll end up, um, you know, throwing countries into conflict in a way that, that will just the poorest are going to be the, the people who suffer most. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>